Forgive me, I only can say two things in Italian. Buongiorno and grazie. <laughs> and <laughs> Maybe pizza too. <laughs> Um, in any event, I want to thank Enos in particular for inviting me. I understand now that this is a very, very important conference. Can you hear me? You can all hear? You can understand? I'll, I'll try to speak slowly. Um, but I, I feel very honored that you have asked me to come here and to speak about some important issues about death and dying. I want to give you a little bit of my history so that you understand where my perspective is on these issues. Um, I am what is considered a death educator. I teach courses in death and dying at my university, which is in Green Bay, Wisconsin, a small city north of Chicago. Um, I have involved students in working in a special day camp for children, grieving children children who have uh, lost their parents or their siblings to death, many of them due to cancer and other degenerative diseases. And so um, I'm coming here today to give you um, a little bit of a perspective of what our understanding is about end of life issues in the United States. And as you'll see, there are many parallels between what is happening in my country and what is happening in your country. And I hope that this can give you a good context for the rest of this very important conference. Um, page down. Ah, okay. So what I'd like to do is talk about um, three important themes that I have about death and dying. Um, I I tend to over-prepare, so I have 57 slides, so I'm not sure if I will get to all three of these themes, but I will get through as many as possible. Um, page down, is that? So the first theme is that I think is important, and I think that Enos gave you some historical context to the field of thanatology, is to understand what it means to talk about death and dying in a culture of death avoidance. So in the United States, as well as in Italy, as I am beginning to understand, we tend to pretend that we are immortal. And maybe there is some value to that. Otherwise, we would all be hiding under the bed today. I want to talk a little bit about my concept of what the experience of dying is all about. I know that um, we have physicians here who look at it from the biological perspective, uh, from the psychological, um, and it's talked about the importance about the psychological perspective, but I'd like to broaden it even further and talk about it more from a systems perspective. And if I get even further, if you're here and you want to listen to me even more, even though it is before lunch, I'd like to talk a little bit about the experience of grief and loss and resilience. So let's start out with this first theme. First of all, what do we mean when we call ourselves thanatologists? First of all, it's a good word to use because nobody else understands what it means. And if you're in a death avoidance society, this way you can have people confused and they won't run away from you. But as you know, it is the study of death and dying. It's named after the Greek god Thanatos. Um, but Bob Kastenbaum, who is one of the founding fathers of the field of thanatology, says it better. He says it's a study of life with death left in. We tend to treat life and death as two dichotomous aspects of the human life cycle but they are not dichotomous. They are part of more of a circle, and I think it helps to conceive of it in that way. And in some of the subjects, when we teach in death education and, um, about death and dying, it is a very broad, multidisciplinary field that encompasses cultural attitudes. And again, I, I have now become very inspired to learn about Italian attitudes about death and dying. Um, beliefs about it across the lifespan. So it's important to recognize that with life 
our concepts and our understanding of what is important about death changes. The process of dying, grief and loss, legal matters. We have become a very litigatious society. Um, as I tell my students, it is not easy to die anymore in America. You have to have money to die. You can't die without money. You can't even die without having a death certificate or multiple copies of a death certificate in the United States, and you have to purchase those. So it's not easy to be dead. Funerals and their rituals, which are constantly evolving and changing. Thanatology is a profession. So Enos had mentioned the Association for Death Education and Counseling. I'm very proud to say that I'm a past president of this very wonderful association. I invite you all to come to their annual conference. It is going to be in Portland, Oregon in um, uh, this coming April. And many of the important figures that um, were mentioned, such as uh, Bob Niemeyer, will be there as well. And deaf education, which you are experiencing right now. So let's talk a little bit about death avoidance societies. I always like to begin this way by talking about the power of language. We speak about death in euphemistic terms. And so in America, we never say, uh, so-and-so died, he passed away, he succumbed, he was terminated, he kicked the bucket, he's pushing up daisies. We have all of these terms. And so I thought, is, are there terms in Italian as well? I don't know if these are accurate. Dr. Google told these to me, okay? So these are from what Dr. Google told me. But if they are, obviously you use euphemistic language as well. It is so profound. Do you send out sympathy cards as well when somebody dies? You send a card to a family or a note. These are sympathy cards in the United States. So these are expressions of grief and condolences. And the research that has been done shows that about 3% of all sympathy cards use the word death. So even when you're expressing your sorrow about death, you cannot use the word. What is it that facilitates death avoidance? First of all, in the year 1900, life expectancy, if you, if you had a good life, was about 50 years of age. As you know now, um, we are growing older and older and older. And so in the United States, um, the mean age of life expectancy is almost 79 years of age. Of course, it breaks down according to social economic status and race. Um, so if you are a poor black person in the United States, you are not going to, it's not expected that you will live as long. In Italy, um, you also have a good life in Italy. So you are uh, at least a long life, Might not, not necessarily a good life, but it is a long life. So, and there's also a tremendous reduction in infant mortality. What has happened, as you probably know better than I, is that now we die of chronic degenerative diseases. We don't die in three days from an infection. And that has created all kinds of problems for us because now we have to deal with these end of life issues that we didn't have to deal with in the past. Somebody got sick, they died. We don't have to talk about end of life care. We don't have to talk about in the past about how long do you keep grandma alive even if she is in a vegetative state. She's not thinking, she's not reasoning. How long do we keep her alive? We have the capacity now to keep a body going almost indefinitely. Do we want that? Do we want that for us? Do we want that for our family? Do you want that for your patients? Those are decisions that have to be made and they're not being made and it's creating all kinds of problems for us. Um, I did find some data here that shows that in Italy, you can see here also that, you, that the population is dying from the same types of 
degenerative diseases, in particular circulatory diseases because we don't behave ourselves. We smoke too much, we eat too much, and we exercise too little. And that is what is happening. So additional factors that are leading to death avoidance. So in the United States, the nuclear family is shrinking. It's getting smaller. And we have a phenomenon known as age segregation. I'm not so sure if that's quite as common in Italy, but in the United States, we are a very mobile society. So grandma lives in Florida, and the rest of the family is scattered all over the rest of the United States. And as a consequence of that, you find that um, there isn't too much mingling between younger people and older people. So younger people do not see what is happening when older family members get sick and die, okay? We also tend to glorify youth, so we shrink away from older people or people who are dying. We also believe that, that science can cure everything. So eventually, science is gonna cure death if, if as well. Um, we also find that because of that, there's a lot of research that is being done on longevity, and there has been some research that has been done in Italy that has shown that it's not, it's a healthy lifestyle, but also genetic factors seem to play into longevity. I must tell you that my father lived till he was 98, and my mother lived till he was 96, so I'm, I'm in for it. In any event, one of the things that I also found is that this woman who has just celebrated her 116th birthday, and she is Italian, um, and uh, she attributes her long life to eating raw eggs every day, three raw eggs every day, and she divorced in the 1930s, and that is what has kept her alive. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that makes us aware of death? So now, what we are finding is that in spite of the fact that we are trying to stuff death under the table, it's going to come out the door. It's coming out, okay? Probably one of the main areas that I feel that has been instrumental in forcing us not to be death avoidant is the media. It is everywhere in the media. Everywhere. It's on television. It's in popular music. It's in books, as you know. And probably the most important source now is the internet and social media. I am doing research now on the impact of social media on the way in which we do death and dying. And it is profound. So even when we try to be death avoidant and we tell, don't tell our loved ones that their prognosis is not so good, you can be sure that as soon as you mention a disease that they are going to go onto the computer and consult with Dr. Do Google, okay? And Dr. Google does not know everything, as you well know. So. Um, people are learning a lot about disease processes and death and dying on the media. Some of the other factors that have been important, um, war and terrorism and mass shootings, I don't have to tell you about the impact of this. Um, concerns about war, uh, atomic proliferation, environmental disasters, everybody is talking now about the dying of the planet. Diseases leading to potential pandemics. Advances in medical technology. I already told you that we are, it's creating all kinds of ethical dilemmas for us. This is something that I don't think you are dealing with yet in this country. But in the United States, this is an area of great concern and controversy. We now have five states in the United States that, including California, which is huge population, which has now legalized assisted death, which is not the same as euthanasia. It is not the same.
but people look at it as if it is euthanasia. And this is something that I think is going to, in, in the pretty near future, be an issue that the Supreme Court of the United States is going to have to confront. Watch for it, it'll be very interesting to see the fireworks. Okay. I think we are becoming, because society has become so stressful, much more, maybe not more religious, but more spiritual, and much more existential in our concerns about life and death. And again, the fact that we are becoming older and a more diverse population makes us aware of how other cultures are treating death and dying and also makes us aware about these death issues that we have been talking about. And there's death coming out the door. So let's now talk a little bit about the experience of dying. I think that we have a tendency to look at dying as an individual experience. But it is not an individual experience. It is a system. We never really die alone. We die in a context. We die in the context of our support systems, whether they are present or absent. We die in the context of what our culture tells us and informs us in terms of what this dying experience is supposed to be about. Our culture communicates to us what is a good death and what is a bad death. In some cultures, it is good to suffer. You must suffer if you want to have a good death. I must tell you that I am of the Jewish faith and we have made an art out of suffering. So, you don't think that's funny? All right, anyway. Um, in any event, we suffer. Um, we, some of us feel that we have to be tough and we have to be strong. Some cultures communicate that you should not talk about death. Other cultures say that you should communicate about death. So how we come to understand our own personal experience comes within the context of our culture, our religious institutions, and our medical institutions. So here in Italy, from what I am understanding, the idea of dying at home is a radical idea. In the United States, hospitals do not want you to die in their institutions. They will do whatever they can to get you out of the hospital because it is not considered a quality indicator to have a high death rate in your hospital. So if they know you're dying, they're gonna put you someplace else. That's a very different kind of perspective and it gives a very different kind of perspective about what um, end of life care is like and where it should take place, okay? The, at the nexus, at the center of all of this is making sense out of the experience. What does this mean to me as a person who is dying? What kind of coherence do I have? I think that because we are very, it's not only a physical experience, it is a cognitive experience, making a coherent sense out of the dying experience is extremely important. And that is where we as support systems come into play to help people make sense out of their own particular dying experience. When does dying begin? That's the first question. This is a painting by Edward Munch. This painting, by the way, um, was about death, and the, um, it, it was not well received when it was first um, uh, painted by a very famous artist here. But we consider, first of all, for the patient and the family and the support systems, dying begins when the facts are recognized. I think as you well know, that just because you communicate and even if you say you have three months left to live, people do not hear this, okay? So it has to be recognized and it has to be acknowledged. Thank you. If the facts are communicated, one of the problems that we have in the United States, and I think the same problem is here, yes, 
that medical students do not get adequate information in medical school about how to communicate bad news. So you don't communicate it, or if you communicate it, you hide it in, the, we use the word jargon. You use medical terminology, which the patient doesn't know, and maybe Dr. Google, maybe on the internet, they'll find out what it means, but it might be misinformation and be misinterpreted. If the patient realizes and accepts the facts, of course you know that there is a lot of denial in the death process. And if nothing more can be done to preserve life. So these are the criteria that we can use to understand in terms of that meaning context when dying begins for the individual and the support system. We also talk about something known as dying trajectories. As you know, not everybody dies in exactly the same way. And it is that pattern of the way in which death takes place that is going to affect the dying experience. So we call it a living dying interval. And the reason why we use that terminology is to help us understand that people are living while they are dying. And during that living dying interval, how people interpret their death is whether or not they know if there's a certain death at a known time. You are going to die six months from now, you're going to die, be dead. Certain death at an un unknown time, you have a life-threatening disease, but we don't know what the course of this disease is going to be like and how long you have to left to live. Uncertain death, but a known time when certainty will be established. We're going to take a biopsy and we will know whether or not this is a malignant tumor. tumor. Uncertain death in an unknown time when the question will be resolved. I think that that's the state that healthy people are in. <laughs> okay. So this is a dying trajectory when somebody dies unexpectedly, okay? So the person is healthy, as you can see, they're healthy, and then there's a collapse of the system. Somebody has a heart attack, a car accident. This is a drying trajectory of sudden traumatic death. I will tell you that this is the kind of death experience that young people have. So when I showed you the mortality statistics and what kills people in contemporary society, that's across all age groups. But when you start talking to a college age population, most of their grief experiences are related to sudden traumatic deaths such as car accidents um, and suicide dying by suicide. So they have a different kind of uh, experience. Other trajectories are the ones that you see in terms of mostly cancer, where you can see the per person is healthy, and then ultimately they show a slow and steady decline, um, and that's some cancers. Some of them have more of a up and down trajectory, that can be very, very hard on the patient as well as on the family. So the person declines and then they go back up again. And you go, oh, he's getting better. And then there's another decline. And then a little bit of a bounce back up again. And oh, it's gonna get better, it's gonna get better. And then they decline again and you have this roller coaster of emotions that is very, very hard to deal with. Um, and then you have the um, more sl slow decline that's even slower than the um, first trajectory, which is a, what you see with dementia, which creates other problems for caregivers, as you well know. So when I talk about dying as being part of a system, there are a number of factors that play into how dying is experienced. Part of it is related to age. Younger people who are suffering from life-threatening illnesses are going to have a different dying experience than an elderly person. Gender, gender comes into it. How men tend to 
um, interpret the dying experience differently than women do, and you have to take a look at how these gender issues play into it. Women tend to be much more of a caregiver than men, and when women are going through a dying experience, they are very, very concerned about who is gonna nurture the family. When men go through a dying experience, they're concerned about how they can't provide for their family, and, and I know that that's very traditional, but it still seems to interpret the dying experience. How well a person can control the situation is also very important. We have a need to feel like we are in charge. And that's where the question about communication and communication context come in and whether or not there is open disclosure and, and you can understand that um, I don't have very long left to live but there are certain things that I can do that I can put in place that is going to make sure that my family's provided for, my kids are gonna be nurtured, that there is enough money left for my funeral, that I can have the kind of death that I want. Um, so you can see here that I'm an advocate for open communication, um, which is something that I know is problematic for some families. How others treat you is also very important and the nature of your interpersonal relationships. The research consistently shows that people who are dying, who have social support, good support systems, have a better quality experience. Um, they live longer, they deal with pain much better than those who are isolated. Social support is instrumental um, in, in, in terms of helping somebody to die. If there's one thing that you could do is to, to have people understand that reconciliation is important when one is alienated from family members. It can really, and friends, it can help a lot. Let me just talk briefly um, about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. You've all heard of the five stages of grief. Everybody knows about it. I want to read to you a quote that I think is very important to understand about the five stages of dying. She said toward the end of her life, it's ironic that she too died from cancer. She said, I now know that the purpose of my life is more than these stages. I have been married, had kids, then grandkids, written books and traveled. I have loved and lost and I am so much more than five stages, and so are you. What is she telling us here? Even Kubler-Ross said, don't box me into a stage. Don't expect that if I go from, don't go from one stage to the next, that I am failing at dying that I am not dying the right way. Here's the say all those five stages. Does everybody accept their death? You know that that is not the case. Is everybody in denial? No. Maybe it's not so bad to be in denial for a while. It helps people to process and to cope. So we are learning that these five stages are not as, um, uh, universal as it was once believed. Now Kubler-Ross was very valuable in terms of getting the dialogue going with regard to death and loss. She did open up the idea that dying is not just a biophysical event, that it's much more than that. It's social, it's psychological, um, it's spiritual. She also helped to demedicalize the dying experience. She made us recognize that the feelings and the experiences that people have when they're dying are not abnormal, they are normal. It's part of life. She helped us humanize death. She emphasize the fact that when people are dying, they still are alive, even if they know that they're dying. They are still living. 
She told us to listen to what the dying people are saying. Don't dismiss them. Don't have them sit next to you and talk to their daughter. Talk to them and treat them as human beings who are worthy of teaching us something. So she said that they were our teachers and our sources of inspiration. It also provides, by the way, if you think about everybody accepting their death at the end, it does provide a very optimistic conclusion to dying. You see, everybody's happy at the end. I accept it. It's not necessarily the case, as you know. Okay. The other thing that people very much like about Kubler-Ross's theory is you can generalize it to everything. People generalize it to divorce. They generalize it to uh, you know, their car, when their car dies. They generalize it to their car. I'm in denial that my car is not functioning. Um, we generalize it to just about everything. So what are some of the criticisms that have come out of this five-stage approach? First of all, Kubler-Ross never intended this to be a prescription for the right way to die. She described what she had seen with oncology patients. There is, and this is an important one, because you're talking about evidence-based practice. And that's where the field in psychology, in, bio, in, in medicine should be. The evidence shows that there is no support for this lockstep five-stage model. No matter how hard we try, there has not been evidence, good evidence for that. Again, she had come up with this theory with oncology patients, but we know very little about how the emotional reactions that cardiovascular patients have, patients that have um, pulmonary diseases. The disease process, the course of dying, is not necessarily the same. She neglected religious factors, ethnic factors, cultural factors. She neglected the effect of the treatment process. Sometimes people can live a long time and feel pretty good with the medicines that they're getting and their social support system, and they might not necessarily go through stages of depression like you see when people are not feeling well. She neglected personality factors. People, the research does show that optimism and a positive attitude goes a long way towards promoting a better quality end of life experience. And that is true for caregivers as well as for the dying. Because let's not neglect the caregivers in this. And again, there's much more variability across people than um, has been acknowledged by this theory. Because it's not one size fits all. The other thing I think that is very important is when we fail to communicate about the dying experience and tell people about their death experience, that their prognosis is not good. The big concern is if you take away hope, the person is going to die. They're not going to follow the treatment process. There is, you're going to take away hope from them. Kubler-Ross and others say, there always is hope throughout the dying process. At first, you hope that the doctor has made the wrong diagnosis. It's not me. You got the wrong, um, the, the MRI is not for me, okay? That hope goes away. It gets replaced by hope that I can live for a long time, that I will outlive my prognosis. Eventually, it could be the hope for having a quality, good death. And that's what we have to explore with individual peoples. What does a good death mean to them? How will they be more at peace at the end? And how will their family be more at peace at the end? So again, as I said, the research shows that there's no evidence of what Kubler-Ross said in terms of these five stages. That's not to say 
that people don't go through those emotions and those experiences and those thoughts that she had documented, just not in a lockstep fa step fashion. What the research is showing, however, is that people are much more resilient than we have been willing to acknowledge. One of the researchers who has been instrumental in promoting the idea of resilience is George Bonanno. He is a professor of social work at Columbia University in New York City. And he has been studying resilience for about the past 20 years. And what he finds that what is much, much more normal is that people generally can, can uh, deal with a lot of tragedy and a lot of loss and still maintain a relatively recent, decent quality of life. And that is true for caregivers as well it is, as it is for the dying. And it is true especially for the grief experience. We, as human beings, have incredible resilience. In terms of our bodies, we have incredible resilience. It is amazing to think about what we can, you know, how we get exposed to so much and somehow we still maintain health. We have a tremendous amount of psychological resilience as well. As long as the necessary support systems are in place, there is a lot that people can endure, a tremendous amount. And I think that one of our jobs as people who are involved in end of life issues is to really help to develop the resilience in people and build upon that natural inclination towards strength as opposed to viewing people as being debilitated in the face of tragedy. When we talk about dying as well, we should talk about the fact that dying has a number of different tasks associated with it. So in addition to satisfying our physical needs, it's maximizing psychological security, a sense of autonomy and richness in living, sustaining, again, those interpersonal attachments. Again, the support system becomes very important. And reaffirming sources of spiritual energy and, again, to foster hope. If we could teach this to caregivers, that this is what their job can be, there will be, we will go a long way towards moving towards a better quality death experience. Let me just, um, hopefully, do I still have time? I don't, <laughs> do I have a few minutes? Okay, good. I, I know I'm right before lunch. I don't want to keep you from lunch. Um, one of the things that I do want to talk about Given that um, I know that communication is an issue, it's an issue in the, in the United States as well as here, what is it that we have learned about communication? So a number of years ago, two sociologists, Glazer and Strauss, went to a number of hospitals in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they just observed how medical personnel and families communicated with patients on an oncology floor in, in these five different hospitals. And again, this was done in the 1970s in the United States. And what they found was that there were four basic patterns of communication that they noted. The first one that they noted was a completely closed communication context. And when we talk about the closed communication context, that is one where the dying patient is ignorant, totally ignorant of the disease process in his or her body. They have no idea. Oh, you are fine. You're gonna be up and about in a, in a few weeks. Next year, we'll take a vacation to Venice, okay? And they have no idea. 
that they are so horribly sick. A more common pattern that they found is a suspected pattern. So the patient knows something terrible is wrong, but is afraid to discuss it with physicians, afraid to discuss it with the family. It is suspected. And then we move on to the game of mutual pretense. And from talking to my new Italian friends, I get the sense that that is what is most common here. And that game of mutual pretense goes like this. I know I'm sick. I know I'm going to die. You know I'm sick. You know that I'm going to die. We're not going to talk about it. Let's just go around and let's pretend that everything is wonderful, okay? And there's violins and there's roses and life is wonderful. And we'll just dance around this. Um, in the United States, we say that everybody eats at the table and there's an elephant sitting right in the middle of the table and nobody talks about the elephant, okay? It's a dangerous context to be in. What we have been promoting more in the United States is an open context where the patient and the family are very much involved in the care um, of the dying. And so open disclosure is now what is being taught in the medical schools. The, those, there, there are workshops and continuing education for physicians. Um, uh, to promote end-of-life communication better for them. I will tell you, however, though, even in the United States, the physicians have a very, very hard time. It is still taught in medical school that death is a medical failure, and so most of the job of that open communication is in the hands of nurses, not in the hands of physicians. But the expectation now is that the patient is um, aware and is told whether or not that patient understands completely and has completely absorbed that information is another problem. But that um, it is felt that open to disclosure makes for a better quality dying experience and that you are not necessarily taking away hope you are changing the hope. And as a consequence, in some respects, it takes a lot of the burden off of the caregiver who is taking care of their loved one because there is more of an open acknowledgement and open discussion. It took a long time for us in the United States to get to this point, a long time. And even when I say this, I don't want to characterize that every, in my country, everybody does this. Not everybody wants to know, and not every family wants to talk about death. So we do have some of those other communication contexts, and it is really important to be sensitive about when it is, um, um, when it is uh, uh, appropriate to have open disclosure, and when it is not appropriate to have open disclosure. Because sometimes you're going against cultural beliefs. In particular, in the case of children, we still have closed communication contexts very often. And there's a very, very strong belief in the United States that you have to protect children from issues about death as much as possible. So there are discussions about how to promote and facilitate end-of-life communication, um, what we call the conspiracy of silence. And again, as you can see here, the evidence suggests is that there is much better outcomes when the research shows that there is much, much better outcomes when information is shared between the patient and the family and the medical personnel, okay? One of the ways in which information can be shared is that there has to be a shift in cultural attitudes as well. One of the things that we have been doing in the United States, and it is an international movement, 
I have it, these links here, but I, I don't know how the internet, well, the internet is working right now, but we have something that is happening internationally known as a death cafe. How many of you have experienced to know about death cafes? Do you know about death cafes? I think in Rome as well. I, I looked it up, so I have the death cafe, the link to death cafes in Italy. Um, what is a death cafe? It is a group of people that come together and they talk about any questions or issues that they might have about death. It's open, it's community death education. The important thing in a death cafe is they say you always have to have cake, okay? But so a lot of times it's held in a coffee shop. Um, there are some that are held in pubs. Uh, that's a different kind of death cafe, I suppose. But it is open up to the community. You have a person who's a facilitator. The person does not have to be a trained psychotherapist. They don't present themselves as being an expert in the field. They just ask a few questions and get the dialogue going so that people can share their concerns and what bothers them. And it has become a movement, an international movement. And this is one way that you can start to change cultural attitudes about open disclosure about death. I think it has to come from the bottom up as well as from the top. It has to come from both angles. So this is one way that you can get this kind of information um, uh, acknowledged, is through the, the Death Cafe. Um, and so I think that that's one important way that you can open up these patterns of communication. I think another way to open up patterns of communication is to start promoting death education and start to take uh, populations that are so ignorant about the contemporary issues that we are facing today and start to teach them, including medical students. Medical students need to understand that these kinds of discussions on understanding about end of life and what it means from the patient and the family and the whole system's perspective is just as important as studying biochemistry and physiology and anatomy. Um, it's, 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 they need to understand that when a patient dies, it is not necessarily a medical failure. It is not a failure. It is a part of life. This is what happens. We all die. And it's a part of life. So education, doing it at the college level. I am teaching young college students about death and dying. They don't necessarily want to hear what I have to say, but they are very grateful at the end because they are dealing and coping with death and loss as well. And they are dealing with family members who are suffering from chronic degenerative diseases as well. So death education is a very, very important um, aspect of opening up that dialogue, okay? Um, and I think that this is a very important quote that um, I'd like to read to you. Whenever we think we are avoiding discussing an important issue because it's what the patient wants, we should use that as a trigger to reflect more deeply on the situation. Is it truly that the patient doesn't want to discuss the topic? Or is it our way of avoiding our own discomfort and our own inhibitions? Or is it both? We should ask ourselves, is an exploration of the topic with the patient going to improve his or her lived experience? If either answer is yes, then it is our professional responsibility to develop respectful, safe, and creative ways to invite the patient into a shared conversation where we can explore this topic. And I think that that it says it much better than I could. What the research shows 
is that what patients want at the end of life is quality. They want adequate pain and symptom management. They want to avoid having their dying inappropriately prolonged. Most people do not want to go on and on and on and on. And that is very hard, as you know, for caregivers as well. Um, they want to have a sense of control. They don't want to feel like they're being burdensome on their families. And they want to have strong relationships with their loved ones. So this is what the research tends to show. How do you get the dialogue going with patients and their families? I want to talk a little bit about a therapeutic movement known as D Dignity Therapy. This is um, an idea that was promoted by a psychiatrist in Canada. His name is Harvey Chachanov. And he has written a wonderful book about dignity therapy. If you want to see it, I have an autographed copy in my briefcase <laughs> um, that I brought with me all the way from the United States. What Chachanov has done is really very simple. He has developed an interview process where he has gone to his dying patients and he said, you know, why don't you just tell me a little bit about your life? What was the most meaningful experience that you had? What were you like when you were younger? What was most important to you? What is your favorite possession? What is something that you would like to say to your children? And he gets a dialogue going. Doesn't use the word death. Doesn't talk about dying. Doesn't talk about cancer. Doesn't talk about heart disease. None of that goes into the conversation. It's more about getting coherence over a life, a life review, but a structured life review where the person tries to make sense of the life that he or she has lived. And all of that gets written down in a document. When the document is finished in the course of this extensive review, um, interview, the document is handed back to the patient and the patient reads it, makes sure that things are corrected that they don't like. And sometimes the document does not necessarily reflect reality as other people would see it. So sometimes people make up things. But it's important to them to remember their life the way they want to remember their life. And that document gets handed over to the significant people in their life as a living legacy. Now, it sounds like a very simple thing to do, but what is very significant about Chachanov's work is that he assessed um, the psychological state of his patients before doing his dignity therapy and after. So it's a pre-post um, experimental design. And he assessed level of anxiety. He assessed degree of depression, de de degree of um, existential angst, if you will. And there is a significant decline in these negative emotions just as a consequence of creating this document. So if I were to go back to that slide that showed you what the dying process is all about, and I showed you the dying person, institutions and culture and support system, and again, remember, in the middle, we talked about meaning making. That is what this process does. It gives the individual a sense of coherence and meaning. And instead of feeling, you know, I led a useless life, which can really create a profound sense of despair as they get sicker and sicker, they start to think, you know, I did a lot of stupid things in my life, but it made sense to me. And this, this all makes sense. And here are the things that I, I do want my family to know. You don't have to use death, you don't have to use the words dying, 
but it does help people to put their lives in, pers in perspective, and it does help the quality experience significantly. So that's another way to get that diet working. So as you see here, in sum, what is dignity therapy? It's asking questions about life history and work, ask them what it is that they want to pass down to their loved ones, what things do they want to say to their loved ones that they never got to say. That is important. And then you create this very meaningful document that is your legacy. It brings a tremendous amount of comfort. So how about I conclude at this point in time, and I'd like to conclude about what a former director of the um, American Hospice Foundation said about what he considered to be dying well. His criteria involves the following, achieving a sense of completion, a sense of completion not only with the world, but with relationships and in the community, finding meaning in one's life, meaning making, experiencing a love of self, experiencing the love of others, allowing yourself to be loved, achieving a sense of completion with your family and your friends, accepting the finality of your life, including being totally dependent. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to handle that one. Grieving for the self, but achieving a new sense of life that goes beyond your own sense of personal loss. And developing a sense of meaning about life in general. I think that that is what Kubler-Ross meant by the dying being our sources of inspiration and teachers. And letting go, that's perhaps an important one as well. So um, I leave you also with this thought as well. Um, for those of us who tend to work too hard and too much, and I'm definitely one of them, I read that a nurse who worked for hospice said that she had talked to many, many people when they were at the last moments of death. She said that many of them wished that they had told the people that they loved, that they had loved them. And she said that nobody that she's ever seen at the last moment of death said that they wished that it had worked more. So just remember that. <laughs> and I thank you very, very much. Wow.